I know this is a Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you can see by the video, I'm recording uh, this weekend uh, from from my home up in Mickey, Tennessee. I wanted to try to, you know, stay off the road this weekend, or this first uh, weekend we have of, of uh, unnecessary travel. And so I appreciate your tuning in and appreciate your attention. If you have your Bibles and want to turn to Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at the first um, eight or nine verses of Philippians chapter four together today for our lesson. We want to, again, thank you for all of the prayers and for all of the, for the interaction that we've been having uh, in, in the midst of all of this isolation, uh, public isolation from one another. Uh, it seems as though uh, you're listening, and I appreciate that so much. And uh, also, we're reaching out to others and want to continue to encourage you to do that, to, to see if there's needs there, for especially those who are vulnerable, who are, uh, you know, try to keep them from getting out and getting exposed. So please reach out to those. Let us know if we can help you in any way to be able to help fulfill that need. And uh, always, if you have comments, if you want to try to, to set up an opportunity to study some more, ask some questions about these things. So I appreciate each and every one of those as well. Let's uh, let go to the Father in a word of prayer before we begin our lesson this morning. Will you pray with me? Our Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, an opportunity, be it a little different than we're used to, but an opportunity nonetheless to be able to worship, to be able to uh, to have that the interaction with you, to have you let you have that interaction with us through your word. We just pray, Father, again, for those uh, who are having to, to go out and, and to put themselves at risk to be able to help others, to be able to keep this, uh, this country going. We just pray safety for them. We pray that uh, you'll be with them and be with their families. For those who are affected by this illness, we pray for healing. We pray for those who are vulnerable. We pray, Father, that you would help them to keep them safe. And we pray, Father, that you will be with all of us. Be with us to be your hands, your feet, your voice, to be able to give comfort, to give, be able to, um, to serve in some capacity in this very difficult time. Father, forgive us where we fail you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you can read the screen, I've tried to put a computer monitor up to kind of give our presentation by. Hopefully, I've got those things big enough for you to look at. But if not, if please, again, feel free to read along in your Bibles as we look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, beginning. Therefore, my brethren, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat you, Doah. And entreat Sethi to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's any thing worthy of praise, think on these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Once there was a young boy who was taken to a local pound by his parents to be able to pick out uh, a new puppy to bring home. And as he stood there with his parents looking across all those uh, bunches of puppies, he pointed one out in particular and said, this is the one this is the one that I want. 
Out of all the dogs that he could have chose, he chose this one particular animal. And so his father just had to ask him, why did you choose this one? And his reply was, well, of all the puppies that you let me see, this one had a happy ending. I'm talking about the dog's tail being one that was wiggling a lot. It's hard to pick a favorite for me amongst all the all of the Bible passages, but it, but if you were to force me to pick a book, I, I guess it would have to be the book of Philippians, specifically chapter four. And here's my reason why. I love the happy ending. Listen again to a few of the words of these that uh, Paul, by inspiration, has given to us. Rejoice, therefore, always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Be, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine any words that are more uplifting, that are more encouraging than these words. If, if you were to read these words without knowing the source of, of who wrote those words, you might have some, seen that it was someone who had a very privileged life. You might have assumed that it was someone who had a, a life that had very little pain in it, that had few hardships, that had few disappointments, but how wrong you'd be. I'm sure that none of us has suffered to the extremes that the Apostle Paul had suffered in his ministry. How then could, could he write such uplifting words? How then could he give us this promise and promise us and his friends this peace of God that passes all understanding? If we could grasp the answer to that, maybe to we can grasp peace in a time of great worry, in a time that, that, that we need this peace so much in our lives, this peace that passes all understanding. If there's anything people in this society need, it's peace. Do you know the bathtub was invented and marketed in America starting in 1850? And since the telephone wasn't invented until 1875, that means that for 25 years, people were able to sit and soak in the bathtub without worrying about a telemarketer. In, in whatever form of or setting, peace is something that we desire. Peace is something that we all need. It's something we all long for, including personal peace, including inner peace. Otherwise, we wouldn't be spending as much money as we do every year on prescription medication and on self-help books, and on time with counselors, which all promise us peace and joy and self-fulfillment. It's a beautiful word, peace. But for a lot of people, it remains just that, a word. It's a word that refers to an ideal that we just can't seem to grasp. Is there anything here in this fourth chapter of Philippians that can give us, help us lay hold on peace? I believe there is. I see four attitudes I want to share with you this morning, four practices which add up to the four R's of Paul, what I call Paul's prescription for personal peace. The first R is found here in this verse, rejoice in the Lord always, verse four. And again, I say rejoice. If you should ask, how can I rejoice when I don't feel like it? I believe Paul would say to you, think first of all about who you are and about who God is. You're not an orphan who's been abandoned at a doorstep. You are a child of God. You are a brother or sister to God's beloved son. Plus, the one who chose you to be his child is not an absentee father. God is here. Whatever your circumstances today or any day, remember, you're not alone. God is with you and he's keeping watch over you. And so rejoice 
in the Lord. Many folks have lived and died and without ever knowing God's peace because they don't know God. One of those that history tells us about is a man by the name of H.G. Wells. You've probably heard his name, probably read some of his stories when you were in school. H.G. Wells was probably one of the more creative people that has ever picked up a pen. He was a very intelligent fellow, but he was also an atheist. In his autobiography, H.G. Wells wrote this confession. He said, I cannot adjust my life to secure any fruitful peace. Here I am at 65 and still seeking peace. I fear it's just a hopeless dream. Number one, to have peace, we've got to rejoice in the Lord. Number two, the second R to look at, Paul also says that we need to rid ourselves of worry by praying about everything. Paul says it this way, don't be anxious about anything, everything, anything, sorry, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known before God. Maybe the Apostle Paul was remembered uh, how Jesus had said it. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 31, Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So the question is, do we really trust Jesus? Do, do we trust him enough to, to, um, to do what he says? And, and that is not to worry, but to trust him with our lives. Do, do that and we'll discover that the enemy of peace is not sickness or poverty or anything else. The enemy of peace, well, it's worry. And, and the way to be anxious about nothing is to pray about everything. Paul would agree with a fellow who penned these words one time, the person who kneels before God can stand up to anything. So that second R is ridding our worry by requesting God, request of God. Number three, we need to replace uh, negative thoughts with positive ones. I think it was Norman Vincent Peale who coined the phrase, the power of positive thinking. But he wasn't the first one to discover the power of positive thinking. Listen again to what the Apostle Paul says by inspiration. Finally, my brethren, whatever's true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. You see, Paul had no training in psychology. It'd take another 1,800 years, as a matter of fact, for the science of psychology to start putting things together. But he, through inspiration, knew that while we can't choose the thoughts which enter in our minds, we can choose which ones we allow to stay there. Early in the 20th century, the great philosopher and psychologist William James said of the human mind, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their own lives by altering their attitudes. James was right about our ability to alter our lives by altering our attitudes. But he was wrong about this being the greatest discovery of the generation. And Paul knew this 1,800 years earlier. And, and this is why he counseled his friends to fill their minds with those things that are good, those things that are true, those things that are honorable. To fill your minds, he says, with those things, then you'll know God's peace. And here's our fourth one this morning for our, our lesson. We need to realize that our faith has got to be put into practice. This fourth ingredient for this prescription is this. Whatever you have received and heard and learned and received and heard and seen in me, verse 9, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. In other words, you just keep on doing what you've heard of me, what you've learned, what you've received. 
You just keep on doing those things. We just got through with a, a two-part Bible study on Wednesday nights about the power of uh, of the influence that 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 uh, that we can put into practice. The things that we can put into practice that will help us to be a, a, a influential in our um, in our worship, in our work for God. These habits are things that we have to work on. And, and so, so is faith something that we have to put into practice. You keep on doing, Paul says, the things that I've, uh, you've heard of me, the things that, that were, I've taught you, the things that you've seen. You keep doing those things. If we say we trust God, then we act uh, as if God's not around, that if everything depends on us, well, then, then we don't know God's peace. If we say that we believe in Jesus and then we proceed to live a life without any regards to his teachings or his example, then we don't know God's peace. When Jesus calls us by his word to seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, he's calling on us to submit to his authority. He's calling on us to, to keep to stay and do for him and, and not keeping God on the outside, not keeping his teachings on the margins of what our life is, not putting him in a little box that we get out on Sunday morning perhaps and for a couple of hours, we, we focus on him. No, he says you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Keep on doing what you've learned. That's what Paul says. And the peace of God, which uh, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote those words to a church in Philippi, which was a Roman in a Roman colony, which stood uh, on which stood Roman soldiers that were guarding that city. The people who would read this letter could look out the window and likely see soldiers walking by or standing there on guard around the perimeter of the city. It's as if Paul was saying, just as those soldiers are standing guard to, to the, there around you, so God's peace will stand guard over your heart and your mind. The other day I was run across an article that I, I didn't know that it happened um, on 9-11. that had to do with the Pentagon. I think this relates remarkably well to what Paul's assurance of God's peace is going to be there is like. According to the article, inside the Pentagon, not far from where the plane had actually crashed into the building, there was a daycare center and it was full of toddlers. The daycare supervisors knew that she must get them out and there's no time to bundle them all together and get them all into uh, to, to carriers and strollers. And just then a young Marine ran up to the door and asked if there was something that he could do to help. And, and, and she said that, uh, that she's going to have to help get, she needs help getting them out. And the young Marine turned around and ran off. And she thought to herself at that point, well, I'm on my own. I'm not going to be able to get this, but with just a few folks that we have here. It said just in a few moments, 40 Marines showed up. And each of them grabbed a crib with a child. And the rest of them started gathering up toddlers in their arms. And, and they carried them to the, to, out of the center and down towards the park near the Potomac River, three quarters of a mile away from what happened to that building. And then those Marines stopped and formed a circle uh, uh, with the cribs like covered wagons in the Old West. And, and then out inside the circle of cribs, they put the toddlers. That kept them from wandering off. And then around the circle of cribs stood 40 Marines standing guard over their children until the parents could show up. Those Marines standing guard over those children are the very image of what Paul is promising his friends that they could depend on God to be like. That this peace of God is going to be if they'll just put their trust in him. 
and, and let their worry stay with him. God's peace, he says, will stand guard. It'll protect your hearts and your minds, just as those soldiers uh, on those walls are, are standing guard. Therefore, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Trust in his presence. Trust in his care. Rid yourself of worry about praying about everything with thanksgiving. Replace all those negative thoughts with positive ones. Think on those things. And then finally, realize that your faith must be put into practice. This morning, as, as I'm speaking to you, there perhaps are some that are listening in and uh, that, that doesn't know this peace of God. And the reason that you don't know this peace of God is you haven't submitted yourselves in obedience to his will. This morning, if you believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, being willing to repent of your sins, confess his name before men, and being baptized to put on Christ. That's how, that's how you access God. That's how you submit yourself to him. That's the point then that he adds you to the church that Jesus Christ gave his life for. Unless we submit ourselves to God, we will not know God's peace. If you have any questions or comments, if you need prayers, if you need to arrange a time where you can sit down and study or, or perhaps sit down and, and come and talk to us and, and let us help you to, uh, uh, to submit yourselves by obeying the gospel, we stand ready to be able to help you in any way we can. Let's uh, go to the Father in a word of prayer, and, and then we're going to come back in just a moment, and we're going to uh, to read some scripture and take the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray. Our holy God, we thank you so much for the peace that you offer to us, that peace that comes from one who can grant that peace, from a father who loves his children, from a father who has the power to be able to help to be able to, to be what we need when we need it. Father, we just pray that you'll help us to cast those cares and worries aside. We pray that you'll help us to, to focus in on the good things. We pray, Father, that you'll help us to be more faithful in reaching out to you in prayer. And that, Father, that you, we pray that you'll uh, help us to, to realize and put our faith into practice. Father, forgive us where we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.